My drawing's a little bit off. But we have the focal length. And so the formula, which I started to write over there until I went off on my artistic tangent, is that one over the focal length is equal to, and I do need to look at this because easily get to the, uh, get something in the wrong position. So one over R2, pretty sure it's plus, yeah, plus one over R1, or R1, R2, doesn't really matter since you're adding. So M is the index of refraction of the lens itself. So if this has index of refraction, index of refraction, M. Let's get the letter R in there. R2 and R1 is, if you imagine that each surface is part of a circle, very similar to what we did with the mirror. So as part of a circle, there is a radius of curvature. So that would be R1 right there from the, from the center to the lens itself. And the other one has its So when writing the lens, if you know what the where the focal point needs to be, and that's typically for glasses, I'm ignoring astigmatism, but typically for glasses, you want the focal point to be right there on your retina, so you actually see, then this in essence is what's used. So it's the same index of refraction. The index of refraction is for this material, which is causing the bending. So. Yeah, the, it's only one index of refraction. We're assuming that the lens is made up of a single material. So let's just do a quick plug and jug. I got radius of curvature, let's say, to. Um, R1 is 30 centimeters, R2 is 20 centimeters, and we'll just assume one point index of refraction of 1.5. And so the focal length, 1 over F, is equal to 1.5 minus 1 times 1 over 30 plus 1 over 20. Five times five over sixty. Well, so I'm getting a focal length of twenty four centimeters. Sometimes I pick random numbers and it works out nicely. Now, in terms of corrective lenses, probably a really horrible uh, local length. Now, if R2 and R1 are the same material, uh, sorry, are the same, so we got perfect symmetry there, then 1 over the focal length, n minus 1 times 2 over whatever the radius of curvature is of each side. If uh, uh, you got 
24. Yeah, how'd you get 24? I got 0.41666. Six, 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 six. That's one over the, did you? You need to do one divided the, by the reciprocal at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not right. All right. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, never mind. So why don't they just go ahead and do that? Why don't they just go ahead and put it one over uh, the this, equation? The focal length is equal to one over n minus one. That one over one plus r over two plus one over r one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess it looks more intimidating. I, I mean, it's sort of setting up for that same type structure that we see for the other one of one over uh, p plus one over q equals one over f. I mean, it's that same adding reciprocals and taking reciprocal at the end. This would be just as valid if, for some reason. The powers that be don't write it that way. At least I haven't seen it that way. Just feel like you, know, you do one over f and you make the this forgetful mistake of forgetting to take the reciprocal of it. On the test, that takes points away. All right. Now. Suppose I have a lens, because my lens is curved outwards here, and it's curved inwards on this side. The bifocals? Uh, they're progressive lenses, but okay. uh, they did that even before I had progressive lenses. So I suppose I have some scenario like this. What happens? But what would be the difference? I got one over F equals N minus one, one over R one plus one over R two. Uh, let's assume that this is one and that's two right there. If the index of refraction, uh, let's say this one right here, or sorry, the R one is 20, uh, Sorry, make like it 30 centimeters here as we had before. This one right here, if the distance from that curve to the center is 20 centimeters, are we just going to get the same answer as we had before? No. What's going to be different? So there's certain conventions that are set up. The lenses, as the light is coming in this way, the lens that is bulging towards it, that's a positive radius. The other one would be a negative radius. So our, so this becomes one over 30 plus negative one over 20. And that's 1.5 minus one, assume it's the same material. And now what do we get? It will not be 24. So what does that tell us about the lens? Very inefficient. Well, it depends on what the purpose is. I mean, as eyeglass. What's that? As eyeglass. I, uh, it, again, it depends upon, it depends upon uh, the person. Well, also, that's a really horrible focal length is, for eyeglasses. That's what, 100 points in So as the light comes in, what happens to it ultimately? Let's see if I can draw it, because that worked so well. Actually, it did not work as badly as I thought it was going to, and yet I still went ahead with it. All right, so the, the one on the right is has a smaller radius of curvature, so let's see, so if I put one like that, 
and smaller, so it's going to be curved more. So the outer one. Put it there, the inner one. axis along that line. So the light coming in straight is going to hit the it's going to hit this first barrier right here and draw a tangent line to that the perpendicular to the tangent line and so this is going to bend uh, close closer to the axis so or something like that and it's going to hit this side and it's going to bend away. There's supposed to be a little, uh, it's not supposed to, that's not supposed to be parallel to that. I'll have to place it there before we get to come here. What did it do to the light ray that was coming straight in? Well, it altered the light ray. All right, if it's this a bent a little bit, and then it turned going out. Okay. I guess they so, kind of like offset each other a little bit. They, they do a little bit, but recognize that ultimately, with my negative focal length, what this ultimately does is it tries not to focus light in on a single point. It tries to spread it out. It puts the, it basically is moving the foc where the light hits farther back. So people who are nearsighted, so I got the, the light comes into the eye here. Like nearsighted versus farsighted? Yeah. Nearsighted, you can't see close? No, near you can. Yeah, okay. I can't always get into the eye. But the trouble is that for nearsighted, the normal lens, of however your eye is, is focus, focusing here. That's, let's say that's where the eye is supposed to be, at the back of the eye. But for nearsighted people, the retina, the back of the eye is farther back. And so the corrective lens, you need to basically push this farther back. And so the, the lens basically is a diverging lens, which forces the light to spread apart more so that it hits the back of the eye. Farsighted people, the opposite. So if that's the normal eye right there, it is focusing light farther back. So let's say your eye's a little bit off. I keep blaming the shape of the eye. It could be the lens also, but it's the light striking back there where the back of the eye was, would normally be, uh, but you need to bring it in the focal point in closer because that's where the back of the eye actually is. And so you have a converging lens. Usually not shaped like that, but basically for far-sighted people, you need to bring the light in closer. Now I'm assuming that most of you have Burnt stuff in the magnifying glass before. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Okay. There was a subtle nod there. <laughs> so that's a converging lens because it gets the light and it shines it down onto you can get to a single point when you're the focal distance away. If you are nearsighted, so sorry, let's start. If you're far-sighted in the woods and you need to burn something. Farsighted lens, lenses for farsighted people are naturally converging lenses, so it is possible for you to actually burn stuff with your glasses. I need to go buy a pair of farsighted glasses. There is a way of keeping them survival magazine. Quite possibly. But if you are nearsighted, the way to you can change your lens, which is normally a diverging lens, into a converging lens, it is possible. Change it upside down. Just to break it no. and then turn it. Turn it upside down doesn't change that. What'd you say? Break these in half and then go in the other. Ooh, I hadn't thought about that with that one. <laughs> I think I would. I was thinking you could actually just, without breaking it, you could actually put water in the lens here. So basically you're creating, you got the lens here and then you got a bubble on top of it that can really turn it into a converging lens. If you really needed to start a fire, you could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you just get on your cell phone and you've got battery power. Sorry, obviously, I'm not one to go out into the middle of nowhere to camp or anything like that. And I don't plan to ever be on a plane again for the rest of my life. 
What's wrong with a plane? I traveled twice a week for seven years on a plane. That was enough. I'm done. What did you do that for? IT consulting. Mm -hmm. I, I lived in Charlotte, but I was working in Delaware most of the time, Pittsburgh most of the time. So. Yeah, it was not a lifestyle that worked for me. I thought you might be operating it. I could, no, no. <laughs> I can imagine getting into a plane as a pilot and suddenly just getting overwhelmed very quickly by all the little dials and panels and things to do. And, was that, talk about the engineering professor who was scared of flying. No. There's a, one of my professors at Duke flew combat missions during World War II for the Dutch Air Force. You don't definitely hear of the Dutch Air Force. I think probably a lot of his friends got killed very quickly. And but he was still he managed to get out and flew combat missions. He said, "I know every way the plane can go wrong from a pilot's point of view." And from an engineering point of view, he hated flying. Absolutely hated it. His solution? To get drunk before he got on the plane. Does that work? It worked for him, maybe, but not necessarily anyone else. I was on a plane once, uh, I was coming back from Rome, and there was a drunk passenger who tried to get into the pilot's cabin. Mm. Yeah, that's a big no-no. What's that? That's a big no-no. Yeah. There happened to be some Army guys, U.S. Army. Not the scrawny 18-year-old who just enlisted. I mean, this is the classic look of Army guys. They basically <laughs> tackled them. The guy got strapped into a seat and surrounded by U.S. military. And then when we got there, the only time I've ever seen this happen, when they got there, the pilot came on and said, please save your seat, tell the U.S. Marshals, take care of this issue. And everyone saved their seat. Nobody, not a single person got up, not even people in the back of the plane, no one got up as the Marshals came on and escorted the guy off. I've only flown like four or five times in my life, and I have already decided I'm, done. I'm, I'm not flying anymore. Because uh, honestly, I'd rather drive I hope you maintain that. You, you, like, because uh, I, I live with my family in Alabama, and it's like a 10 hour drive. I'd rather drive 10 hours than fly on a half hour or an hour long flight. Yeah, you're on the plane for an hour, and then you have a three hour layover in Atlanta for some reason. Yeah. And you fly to Dallas and stay there for three hours, and you fly back to Alabama. Actually, it's a, uh, uh, you can go straight from Greensboro to Atlanta to Panama City, and then I can drive to Alabama because it's uh, very, very close to the town I used to live in. Um, well, I uh, have shut down an engine in it. Oh, yeah? Yes. Flying to Rhode Spain as a young Navy lad working on P3. Ah, uh, that's many years ago. Many years ago in the 70s. And we had a generator problem. And that's one of the emergency receivers. You reset the generator, if this generator don't reset, you pull the E-handle. We had four E-handles. And you shut down the engine, had a pilot collapse, our emergency. Because we had four prop engines anyway. So we flew on by our merry way. I think you just described what's wrong with the plane, mm -hmm. right there. All right, Finland. Now the Lisbon's equation actually works for, uh, for thicker or some odd ones, but we'll specifically spend more time on Finland's. And there's gonna be a focal point. We'll start out with a classic example here. So we have some focal point here, distance F from the middle of the lens. So distance F here. And as mentioned earlier, that if you're going to burn stuff, you basically are establishing where the focal length is, because light that comes in straight or from a, such a far distance like the sun, it will 
bend towards the focal point. So while you're coming in here, we'll bend towards the focal point. No, I think you tried that, the breaking the glass in half, because these glasses I got recently because mine snapped in half. Ah. Uh, so I could, I could try it. Excellent. Let us know on, uh, I guess whenever you have that done. I guess I have an old pair at home, too. All right. So this reminds me of the story of the, there's a father who had beef, raising beef cattle. And he figured it was time to retire, so he called his, his three boys together and he said, Sons, it's time for me to let you take over the ranch. And he said, sure thing, Pop. So first thing they did was to change the name of the ranch to Focus. And the father thought this was odd, but you know, he thought dirt's there, they can do it. And time went on, he still was more and more curious about why they changed the why his his voice changed the name to Focus. And so eventually he called them together and he said, Sons, um, why did you change the name of the ranch to Focus? And they said, come on, Dad. Everyone knows is that Focus is where the sons raise meat. Yeah, I've been waiting for this point. Mm. First day of class, you're in there. Yeah. Only, six, only seven more weeks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I got a logarithm joke, too. When I, when I was teaching math, I was waiting you know, almost the entire semester to get the logarithms. All right, and then light that comes in through the center will just basically pass through. Now, in reality, if I've got a block of glass, for example, and the light's coming in like this, it is going to refract. And then when it comes out, it's, it's going to come out at the same angle at which it came in. So if whatever angle that is, it's the same angle there. So it's going to be slightly offset, sort of talking about the, the glass, which throws things off. But the thin lens is small enough so that we are assuming that it's really not going to distort too much in that small, the small little gap there. <clears throat> so if I'm looking at something that's not far away, I'm basically going to represent my thin lens as just a straight line. Yeah, you know, light bends as it goes through, but with a thin lens, it's thin enough that we can approximate it by a straight line. I have some axis of symmetry here. 